You're listening to episode 70, Facing the Fear of Rejection to Overcome It, with Sherry Eldridge. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome to this episode, and thank you for tuning in this week. I'm always grateful to have you here. And I have another great guest for you. But before we get into today's episode, I do want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So today I'm going to be joined by adoption author Sherry Eldridge, and we're going to basically continue the topic that we were talking about last week and that of adoption and how it can be a traumatic experience for the adoptee. So Sherry's going to share her story and what it was like for her being adopted as a baby. And in particular, she's going to talk about how she's had to deal with attachment disorder as a result. She's going to talk about how she wasn't able to bond with her mother, her adoptive mother, until she was 20 years old. And she's going to share what happened when she found her birth mother. And then, like I said, we're going to talk about attachment disorder and what that has looked like for Sherry in her life. And she's going to share how she's been able to get connected with other adoptees and how important that's been for her. And she'll talk about how adoption has ultimately been a good thing for her. And she's also going to talk about how she chooses daily to face the fear of rejection. So if you liked last week's episode, then you'll definitely like this one as well. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it, and I'm going to bring Sherry on. Sherry, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here to share your story with us. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, my pleasure. So you and I got connected through my previous guest, Lisa Floyd. Yeah. Yeah, and you're both fellow adoptees who have had to go through the trauma of being separated by your birth mothers, or or from your birth mothers, and all the issues that that can lead to. And now today you're considered an expert in all things adoption, and you've written several books on the topic, including the bestseller, 20 Things Adopted Kids Wish Their Adoptive Parents Knew. So I'm really interested in continuing the discussion on this topic that was started last week with Lisa, and get to have you share your story with us and how you've been able to get to a better place today. Oh, I'd be honored to do that. Yeah, great. So what I like to do is have you start us off by sharing your story, and then we'll take it from there. How does that sound to you, Sherry? That sounds good. Sounds very good. Great. Well, um, an interesting part of my story is that a lot happened during conception. Uh, I haven't shared this a real lot lately um, because, you know, sometimes things just aren't important to you and then they rise up and they are more important. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the first thing I want to say is that that my birth mother was raped and um, I was, quote, conceived in rape. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the story. So all along, she did not want me. She did not take care of herself. Um, 
And when I found that out, it was just a very difficult thing to deal with because I thought, well, you know, was my life a mistake or is my life a mistake? Um, mm. And when did you find that out? I found it out when I first talked with her. I was 47 then and I'm 60 now. So um, for all those years, I didn't know it. Okay. However, um, Melissa, I, I walked into a um, counselor's office down here in Indianapolis after we had moved from Michigan. And um, I didn't know the guy. He didn't know me. I walked in, sat down in the chair, and the first thing he asked me was, was your birth mother raped? Hmm. And I was shocked. I thought, why would he ask me that? Right. And so there have been different signposts along the way that as I look back I know it's true so anyway you know I was basically an unwanted baby and you know what happens to those of us that are in that stage I mean the the birth mother sets the emotional tone for the baby and Mm. the baby knows if if he or she's not wanted and so um I had a rough beginning before I was born, even. And then I was born, and I I was born in St. John's, Michigan, and um, delivered by a physician who I found out later cries at the birth of every baby because he was an orphan himself. Um, And I was so tiny that they whisked me away to an incubator, which was the brand new invention in 1945 and so basically I was not touched for 10 days before my adoption so Mm. there's another huge issue uh, that has been you know mine to deal with throughout life right I imagine that's a very important thing to be held as a baby right when you're born yeah and you wouldn't be surprised to know that that's my love language Mm. I love it when my husband holds me or he holds my hand or whatever. It just means so much to me. Mm-hmm. And so, so, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I Go ahead. You can continue. Okay. Well, at 10 days of age, um, my dad came down to the hospital, my adoptive dad, and signed the papers. I believe I cost um, like $14.57 or something like that. I mean, Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you, you compare what it's like, you know, without her parents. Thousands and thousands of dollars. But mine was a private adoption. It was arranged by my adoptive grandmother who ran the orphanage. She was the matron of the county orphanage in Clinton County, Michigan. And um, she had arranged somehow. I wish I could bring her back to ask her questions, but I can't. Uh, she arranged for my private adoption. Um, and anyway, um, she carried me into my mom and dad's arms. And when they saw her bringing me into the house, they were so excited. And my dad always told the story about how he said, you were so tiny, I could hold you in the palm of one of my hands. <laughs> and he loved telling that story, and I loved hearing it as an adoptee. That means a lot to us to hear our stories because it makes us feel like we belong with our parents. Mm. So what was life like for you growing up, and, and when did you find out that you were adopted? Well, um, life was good. Um, I found out when I that I was adopted when I was just a wee little girl, and I don't even remember. You know, it seems like I've always known. However, it was told to me once, but then it wasn't an ongoing conversation like we try to encourage parents to do now, to normalize it, to make the birth family part of it, all that stuff. In fact, the, the advice I got from my mother was, if you want to be rich, contact your birth father. So <laughs> I think a lot of adoptees get that too. They, you know, get things like that. But I grew up as an only child. And I, mo- most of my playmates were kids from the orphanage. They were my best buddies. 
Mm. So I, I kind of learned all the dynamics through my life. Um, I was with all the abused and abandoned kids. and um, So you could all relate to each other? We could, yes. And those are some very warm memories that I have uh, mm-hmm. in my childhood. Um, my parents were, you know, tried the best that they knew how, but I know now that I suffered from attachment disorder, and I was really a handful for them. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'll tell you one story to show you how I was a handful and how they didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I was the pleaser adoptee, and I love cleaning the house for mom and dad while they were gone. So one day I did it. I cleaned it all the way through, and when I got to their bedroom on their fancy furniture dressing table, one of mom's brooches was open. So the the pin was laying open. And all of a sudden, I was scratching into their fine furniture. I love you, Mommy, and I love you, Daddy. Can you imagine? I did that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and um, so when they got home, I took them on a tour room by room. And when they got to the bedroom, my mother's mouth just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, we love you too, honey. <laughs> didn't know what to do. I mean, there were no books out there about that's a sign of attachment disorder. Uh-huh. So they just, you know, they kept it. And when both my parents died, they still had that dresser. So um, they were very loyal parents. They loved me as best they knew how. And um, But it was hard to make connections because of my inability with attachment disorder. And, and they had ungrieved losses from infertility Mm. so most of the time we were like three ships passing in the night we didn't really emotionally connect until i was 20 years old and i came home with my boyfriend and my mom of course came running to greet me and i was sobbing and she said um what's wrong? And then she started going through all the questions, you know, that a good parent would, like, did you flunk out of school? All these different things. Mm -hmm. And then at last, she said, are you pregnant? And I fell to my knees. My knees just buckled and I was sobbing. Mm -hmm. She reached down and put her arms around me. And I think that was the first time we ever bonded. And I was 20 years old. Oh, wow. But she was always there for me. My dad ran in the other room. So um, that did not feel good. But, Mm. um, you know, up until that time that, you know, they wanted to put me through college. It was in my third, fourth year of college, actually, when I got pregnant. And by the way, that is very common for adoptees, um, uh, female adoptees to become pregnant. There's no research on it, but I've talked to so many adoptees, and I believe it is a, a sign of grief. It's We're trying to connect with our birth mother in the only way that we know how. So anyway, here I was pregnant, and we got married because we loved each other, and um, went on. We had two daughters, and um, and it was then that I began thinking about my birth mother. and. Um, So just to sum up the first part of my life, my biggest, well, one of my biggest traumas was losing my birth mother. Mm -hmm. And that carried through with the attachment disorder, you know. And then when I was 47, I had been doing an ongoing search for years, writing secretly to the, the court in Michigan to grant me my papers. And I learned you never say adoptee and all that stuff. Um, But I searched and searched. And then I met a woman from Michigan who loved adoptees. And within two days, she had found my birth mother. Wow. And um, how did that make you feel? To find her? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It was incredible. Um, I couldn't... I don't know. All of a sudden, I felt like this fantasy person in my life was a real person. You know, Mm. she had a real name. 
She had a real phone number. We found her through, this woman was incredible in the way that she helped me find her, but we found her through uh, funeral home records. Um, and, and before that, health department records and, and microfish from a Latter-day Saints church. And, you know, she was just a genius at doing this. And so I was scared. I was really scared, you know, because she was going to call her and make the final, the first contact, which is what I would always recommend because the birth mother will likely be just scared out of her mind. Right. And um, especially, it's not something she'd be expecting. No, she wouldn't be expecting. And um, it, it just, it's not a wise way to do it. And mm -hmm. so this woman became my intermediary. And um, within two hours, she had me in touch with my birth mother. Well, let me add, before I was put in touch with her, she said she didn't want any contact with me because she had been raped. So there we go again. There's a rape theme. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, you know, the optimistic adoptee, at least I know who she is. At least, you know, I was talking to the to the intermediary and then the phone clicked in and it was my birth mother and she changed her mind. And so we oh. talked, yeah. And Yeah, how did that how did that go? Oh, it went very well. I but you know, the whole time Melissa, I was I was so scared that she was gonna reject me. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep saying to myself, now, she's not going to reject you, Sherry. She's not going to reject you. She's your mother. And, you know, she just kept showing off all the glitzy things in her life. And I kept thinking, I'm just a small town girl. And, I, you know, I, I can't identify with all this stuff. And so anyway, we, we talked for about two hours. And when I went to bed that night, I felt complete. I felt like a piece of the puzzle had been put in place. Mm -hmm. um, and then I entered it into the honeymoon stage and told everybody that I had found my mother. Mm -hmm. Postman, the FedEx guy. You know <laughs> <laughs> and so within two weeks, we were reunited. And um, what started out as a fairy tale reunion, just to make the story not too boring, uh, ended in a gut wrenching rejection. Uh, when after a week re of reunion, I called her to thank her, and um, she basically said she wanted nothing more to do with me. Mm. The tone of her voice had changed. She was mad, um, and it was that was trauma number two for me because that is the um, basic fear of adoptees of many adoptees, I should say. I can't speak for everyone, just for myself. Mm -hmm. But it was devastating. And Yeah, to get rejected again. Yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't believe it. And but why why do you think it happened? Did she just like did she just get scared or Well that's a good question. Um I think she was scared, yes. I wonder if I reminded her of her birth of her rapist. If my physical mm. appearance reminded her of him. Um, another fact that I know for sure that she had never grieved her loss. And she had two, I have a step, I had a stepbrother and a stepsister. And, but Elizabeth was her name, had lost like three babies in between. And she had never grieved those losses. So she was just on emotional overload mm -hmm. when I met her and everything just came up in her face and couldn't handle it. Um, she was offered help. My step, step cousin ran an adoption support group there and asked her to come and get support, but she refused. So it was that generation of birth mothers. Of course, things are very different now. I love the open adoption uh, phenomena that's happening in the United States, and I guess it is in Canada, and I don't know where else. But um, yeah, that was what happened. And um, so, what happened to you after that? Like, how how did that affect you? Well, um, 
I was, you know how you're just kind of numb? You can't believe what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. And she was just ranting at me to talk about bullying. She was bullying me. Mm -hmm. And the words, I'm a Christian, and the words of, um, let's see, Isaiah 49, 15 to 16 came to my mind at the same time. And it said, and that verse says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Yes, she may. But I, this is God speaking, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, and your walls, your life is always before me. So that helped me to realize within time that that was God, God assuring me that he was in me, for me, with me, around me, you know, that I didn't need to be afraid. But it took me a few days to process all that because I was traumatized. Mm -hmm. So I just ran down to my husband and he held me while I sobbed. So, um, did you get to meet any of your birth family? Yes, I did. Uh, my half sister was there at the plane to meet us. Bob was with me. And, um, the first thing she said when I got off the plane was, look at the nose, look at the nose. Gosh, <laughs> I could have just died. Um, apparently, we, my mother and I have the same noses, so it really made me self-conscious. And <laughs> I had wanted Bob to, you know, take video of the whole thing, and all he got was the inside of the airport roof. <laughs> 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 so um, that was how it all began. I didn't know if I would laugh, if I would cry when I first saw her. It was just totally uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just kind of, we sat in the back seat on the way to the inn. She had gotten us a penthouse at the inn that her friend owned. And there were roses and a, a sign, that, a little card that said, Welcome to your, welcome home, Sherry and Bob. And, um, you know, a sign over her door that said, Welcome to your family. But she just couldn't take it. She just couldn't take it. Mm. Did you get to see um, either your stepbrother or your stepsister again after this? No, I, I had, we had dinner with my stepsister and her husband, but I never saw her again. I wrote a couple times to her, but there wasn't a connection there. Mm -hmm. Then three years ago, I met my half-brother on Facebook. Okay, so this is a different person that you hadn't known about before. I knew about him, but I didn't. Well, let me just add this. This will help you understand the chronology here. I have a birth cousin who is a um, genealogist, and she had sent me the whole family tree on my mother's side. So I knew that I had a sister named Debbie, and I knew I had a um, brother named John different fathers for them so they were step okay but John he spells his name J-O-N and I started searching you know one day on Facebook and by golly I found him and mm -hmm. I wrote to him and I said I think we you know we are related and I said I think your mother's name is Elizabeth and he wrote back to me right away, and it, actually, it was his son, and um, he put me in touch with my brother, and it was wonderful. We talked the first time, um, probably a couple hours, and, you know, first thing he said to me was, oh, sis, you are so beautiful, <laughs> and he was just such a teddy bear, just a sweetheart, and I loved him from the very beginning. We both you know, there wasn't that baggage. He was brought up by my birth mother and and really had a lot of abuse. So he, you know, wouldn't even hardly think about her. Um, mm -hmm. He loved me to pieces. He just adored me. Um, he was an alcoholic who was recovering. And so, but when I um, got word from him, that he might be dying, 
I jumped on a plane all by myself and went out to Reno and found him. And um, that was an awesome experience to see him for the first time face to face. Have you seen him again since then or what happened there? Well, we had a week, week long reunion. You know, I was staying in the hotel and he and his wife and stepson came over and swam in the pool. They interviewed us on I, the radio station out there in Reno. I can't remember the call letters. Uh, we just, we went out to dinner. We had our pictures taken together. Um, we just did everything we could. He, we took him to get a haircut at Great Clips and he came out looking like he was so handsome you wouldn't believe and we took him shopping at Walmart and you know to get Levi jeans and all this you know just crazy <laughs> little stuff ate, mm-hmm. ate almost every meal together I got to meet other relatives while I was out there and um so we said goodbye after we had our family pictures taken and I just knew I was going to see John again and but he was crying when he said goodbye but I thought, oh, well, you know, it'll be okay because I'm coming back out for our birthdays next year. And so I got a call about four or five months later telling me that he was on life support. Mm. And I said, well, I will be out. I will be on the next plane. And they said to me, Sherry, it's too late. He's gone. Mm. He's brain dead. So. One of the relatives who happened to be a hospice nurse said to me, would you like to say some last words to your brother before they take him off the machine? And I said, yes, I would. And so they put the phone up to his ear and, you know, they say hearing is the last to go. I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. true or not. But um, I just kept saying, John, I love you so much. You are just such a special person in your life. I hope we get to see each other in heaven and um, just things like that. And that was done. And mm. um, Less too bad, but I'm sure you were, you were very grateful that you had the opportunity to, to meet him and that that went well. Absolutely. I'm so grateful for that. And he filled up my heart so much. He filled up, he filled a place in my adoptee heart, a hole in my adoptee heart that I didn't even know was there. And he brought me so much joy. Mm, that's great. Especially because, like you said, you you grew up an only child. Yeah. So you didn't get to have that kind of experience growing up. That's right. And I always, you know, was trying to talk my mom and dad into adopting one of the kids from the orphanage. But they thought they were too old. They adopted me in their 40s. So, um, I, yeah, I grew up an only child, and he was just like straight from heaven. <laughs> he was wonderful. Mm. So t- tell us, let, you know, let's talk a, a little more about the ways, you know, the, the ways in which you were affected. And you've been talking about, you know, attachment disorder. Mm. And for those who who are not too familiar with that. I mean, can you kind of tell us a little more about that and sort of, um, you know, how that plays itself out and that sort of thing? Sure. I'm not an expert on it. I'm not a clinician. So I'll just tell you. Just just from from your experience. Um, Well, I scratch things, obviously. (laughs) I stole things. Like I would, even though I had everything any kid could ever want, I would go down to a store and steal something, or I would go into a neighbor's closet and steal clothes. Um, I had a horrible temper. Horrible. It was more like rage. Um, My mother just called me wild. She didn't know what to do with me. Um, I, I tended to be a very high achiever covering up all the pain that was in there, um, did well, um, well, fairly well with friends, um, but it's kind of like I was living a double life, um, you know, there was the wounded child trying to get her needs met, and then, you know, the 
mask of the strong person, which can fool parents very easily. So, what, well, anyway, I won't get off on that. But um, yeah, my kitty was my best friend, my cat. <laughs> and I, I hope this doesn't offend adoptive parents because I'm just trying to shed some light on this. But the other relatives in my adoptive family, because I had attachment disorder, they didn't seem real important to me. They didn't seem real. And um, that's all I can say. I just, they didn't seem real because I, I couldn't see them as they really were. Mm-hmm. So there was a wall. You know, there was a wall. And, um, yeah, I was, I was clumsy. I had sensory issues. I still do. Um, I have dyslexia. Um, you tell me a number and I'll write it down backwards. <laughs> um, so I, that's about all I can think of right now. Yeah. Not a pretty picture. <laughs> yeah, not a pretty picture. No. Um, yeah. Now, so your husband that you're married to today, how long have you guys been married? 50 years. 50? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And how has he been for you through these years? Has he has he been I mean, I know you've already talked a little bit about how supportive he's been, but I mean, has he been able to sort of understand the issues that you're going through and and where you're coming from with all that? I would say for for the last 20 some years he's been able to understand, but before that, he was immersed in work. Remember we were thrown into marriage and motherhood and fatherhood, you know, all at once. So he was working so hard to try and support us. And so he got waylaid. He didn't have attachment disorder, but he was kind of addicted to work to, you know, do enough to to make well for all of us, which he had. Um, we never dreamed that we would end up in the place we're in. So, yeah, he's, although, you know, I must say that when I was searching and found Elizabeth. Um, I was alone. I mean, his family didn't support me. He he was afraid that I was going to get hurt. And so when I called him all excited about it, he just, you know, I woke him up from his sleep. He didn't get it. Uh, and, and that's a good point for many adoptees to remember that, you know, people that are un- not adopted are not going to get the intensity that we feel. Mm-hmm. They're just not gonna, and so we've got to look to our fellow adoptee friends, which are such a gift. Um, they get it right away, and so um, I would encourage any adoptee that is searching to get a, a broad base of support with fellow adoptees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I imagine that's been very helpful for you, and yeah, through the years. Uh, when did you sort of start getting? into groups with other adoptees and and just connecting with others? Um, Well, when I was in college at age 47, finishing my degree, I wrote a paper about my experience of reunion. And I also founded um, an organization called Jewel Among Jewels Adoption Network. And I began connecting with a fellow adoptee, Jody Maureen, and she and I began a newsletter um, called Jules News. And so I connected with Jody, and through the whole experience with that, I connected with professionals and other adoptees and stuff like that. Um, we did have a Jewel Among Jewels, um, uh, what do you call it, boot camp live in 2011 and those are my dearest friends i stay in contact with them and they've all gone gone on and done wonderful things one of them is pam krosky who just was the key person in legislating open records for adoptees in indiana Mm. another one was lisa floyd and she's getting her master's in trauma therapy and she wants to help adoptees Mm -hmm. um yeah, it, I mean, it was, I've got a lot of close friends, and, and 
And it's so it's an essential for an adoptee to have friends. Um, I interviewed more than 70 adoptees for my book, 20 Life Transforming Choices Adoptees Need to Make. And it was so interesting, Melissa, because, you know, we all thought we were kind of weird. We discovered we all thought we were kind of weird and we, you know, keep our cards close to our chest. But, you know, once we'd gone through all the questions and everything for the book, they said, well, I feel like I just had therapy. (laughs) (laughs) And I know that I'm not alone anymore. So I had contact with adoptees from age 7 to 70. And when I wrote the book, I thought 70 was really old. Now I don't think (laughs) it is. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I I know many, many adoptees now. And, you know, I liken the friendships of adoptees to... You know, when you think about a tightrope walker, the adoptee is the tightrope walker, and she's she or he is walking across the tightrope. Well, if if the adoptee falls, there's a net beneath them, and that is fellow adoptee friendships. We have to mm. say goodbye to therapists, you know, people that have helped us in the professions, but ultimately, adoptee friendships never fail, and so it's like a net. The safety net that we always must keep in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So aside from these friendships and having the support of other adoptees, uh-huh. what what other things have helped you to get to where you are today? Well, writing has really helped me. It's helped me a whole lot. Um, it's very therapeutic to journal, to write articles, blog articles, which I do almost every day. Um, I'm on social media a lot, um, on Facebook under my name, Sherry Eldridge, and then a second site under adoption author, Sherry Eldridge. So all the people that are most interested in adoption should come to that site. Um, I've started boxing. I'm a boxer. I love it. Um, and I I work out at least three times a week, a real heavy workout, and that has done wonders for my health because I have lupus. Mm -hmm. I've had a hard time finding a sport that would accommodate all my limitations. (laughs) 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 So I love boxing. I just go in there and just hit it hard. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I just, um, I love that. I love being with my six grandchildren. Um, between ages 12 and 20 and um, love my friends, my neighborhood. I just love my life. I'm so glad I was adopted because it has forced me to dig deep, to research, to interview people. And, I, you know, I've grown. I, I don't know where I would be if I hadn't been adopted. Mm. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. How how would you say that you're doing overall today, Sherry? I mean, what sorts of things do you still struggle with? Well, um, I'm doing great today, but I am reminded often that adoption is a lifelong journey. And oftentimes, I mean, I I don't know if it ever goes away. I don't think it does. But for me, the fear of rejection is so ingrained into my psyche. Maybe because of the, you know the in utero experience with my birth mother. I don't know, but it's really strong for me. And um, every day I have to remind myself, this is not rejection, and then reframe it. So it's a daily, daily choice that I have to make. Mm, reframing it, that yeah, that's important. Right. And that's where the 20 Choices book comes in that has been a big help to adoptees. I've just written the second edition of that. It was published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers out of London, and I've rewritten at least three to four chapters in it, dealing with adoptee anger, adoptee depression, uh, how to find your life purpose, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things that that you mentioned there that you know, you experienced was that anger. And I mean, that's common to 
survivors of, of different types of things. So I'm curious, um, what's, what's been able to help you deal with that? I think that's maybe that could help a lot of the listeners to hear. Sure. Well, I learned a difference and it's going to sound really simplistic, but it didn't really get into my heart until I understood the difference between healthy anger and non-healthy anger. Um, I think for me, it's almost like scrambling eggs, you know, you get the yolk and the white and, and I just scrambled them all together. And whenever I got angry, the whole thing flew like, you know, anger from my past and anger, you know, what's triggering it in the present. And so I encourage adoptees to make an anger list, you know, of everything you're angry about, heard about, and then make a list about another list about what are you angry about right now. And then I encourage adoptees and anybody really to um, grieve the losses of the past. Um, I have an exercise that I call I call the grief box, and it's an exercise in working, practical exercise in working through your grief and loss. Um, and so, for me, if I can think, oh, that's where that came from. That's old grief that's trigger, being triggered right now in the present. I have had a huge change in my anger response to life. It's really even my husband noticed it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I just um Well that's great. I I think that's really helpful. And yeah, like you say, I mean some some anger is healthy. It's it's normal. You know, but it's it's dealing with the anger that's not good for us and that's right. You know, yeah, healthy yeah. is a God given emotion and it it's like a red light on a dashboard that tells us you know, something's not right here, you know. Yeah. I think sometimes it can get difficult to to differentiate between them. Isn't that so true? Yeah. That was true for me most of my life. Mm-hmm. Just like scrambled eggs. Yeah. Scrambled all together, the past and the present. Yeah. And the poor person who's the recipient of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I know for some people that it, it's like a shock to them to hear that, like, you know, some anger is okay, it's normal, and it's healthy. Yeah, but rage is not okay. Right. <laughs> That's coming from old stuff. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, so, so, Sherry, tell us more about what you do and what you have going on today. Well, um, up until the last few months, I've, I've traveled with speaking. Uh, I haven't been doing much speaking lately. Um, I don't know why. You know, I've never asked for a speaking engagement. So I just wait for them to come, and I usually say yes. But I've had some nice time at home. Um, I've been, for the last year, I've been writing a devotional. Um, for New Hope Publishers called 20 Things Adopted Kids Wish, which is my brand. And then under the tagline is uh, Daily Devotions for Adoptive and Birth Parents. And I'm very, very excited about that because there's nothing out there, nothing, Melissa, um, to nourish the souls of these dear people. And so... Um, I've organized it into 12 metaphors that they can, it also teaches them how to keep in mind what's happening throughout the day. And they can also use it with their children, like for dinner conversations and stuff. So that's what I've been doing mostly. And then I, you know, I spend two or three hours on social networking, which is too much. But I love <laughs> Facebook and I love Twitter and all the good stuff. You know, it's just fun for me. And um, I'm boxing. I'm, you know, spending every minute I can with my adult daughters, two daughters, and their husbands and grandchildren, and just at a good place. That's great. That's really great. So I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. Okay. And that is, given what you know now, mm -hmm. if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times, 
and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? It would be to remember that God's holding me, even though I can't feel his presence. He was holding me in the womb. Psalm 139 says, you know, he was there when I was being woven together in the secret places of the womb. And he was there when I was rejected by my birth mother. And he's here with me now. And so many times we can't see we can't see his hand in things, we can't see his sovereign hand, but he promises and he's always faithful to never leave us or forsake us. And so that's what I remind myself of and that's what makes me strong. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So um now, before I let you go, Sherry, um, let us know where people can find you and how they can connect with you. Sure. Um, they can, my website is SherryEldridge.com, and Sherry is S-H-E-R-R-I-E. I spell it a different way than some people. Um, I'm on Facebook under Sherry Eldridge. I'm also on another Facebook page called Adoption Author Sherry Eldridge. And if you're interested totally in adoption, that's the place to go. I'm on Twitter as Sherry Eldridge. Um, most of the social networks I'm on. So, yeah. I would love to hear from anyone that wants to write to me. And um, my email is, this is really long, Sherry, <laughs> Sherry's Heart Language at gmail.com. All right. Say that one more time for people. Sure. Sherry's heart language at gmail.com. All right. Great. And I'll have all your links on your show notes page for people to go and check out. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. I, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. And I'm, I'm glad that Lisa connected us. Yes. And, yeah, it's just, you know, great to continue this topic of adoption. And, you know, I mean, I know for, for myself, when I was first um, doing some research into it, when I was getting ready for my call with Lisa, you know, a lot of it was just so very new to me and, and really kind of eye-opening. Um, and I, I'm sure that it's been for, for the listeners here as well. Um and so just, you know, thank you for, 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 you know, coming on and, and, and telling us a little more about all of this stuff and, um, and just, you know, the journey that you've been on to get you, to get to where you are today. And, uh, you know, and, and thank you for the, the work that you're doing today. I'm sure that you're helping many other adoptees out there as well. Thank you, Melissa. It's been so much fun talking with you. I, Hope it has been helpful to many people, and it's going to be fun to see where your path leads in the future. Um, I think it's fascinating that you're um, you're so interested and curious about adoption. So yay, raw for you! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting topic, and uh, you know, I mean, it's definitely something that can be. Uh, you know, traumatic for the adoptee. So I think it's, it's an important one to cover, to look at. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for helping us find our voice and, and use our voices on your show. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Sherry. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too, Melissa. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 70. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Sherry Eldridge to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I want to talk a little bit more here about facing the fear of rejection. You know, I think that's something that's common to all of us, to fear being rejected. You know, it's just kind of a human nature thing. But of course, for some of us who have been through experiences like Sherry's or, you know, especially if we've been bullied or abused and we have a low self-esteem and we don't 
think very highly of ourselves or feel very good about ourselves, and we're kind of always seeking approval of others, then I think we have that fear even more so. But I also think that the only way to really get past that is to face it. And you know what? Sometimes people will reject us no matter what. Like, it's nothing that we did. It's not our fault. They will just reject us for their own reason that, you know, we might not understand. And really, we don't have to. There's that saying, right, that what someone thinks of you is none of your business. It's about feeling good about ourselves and who we are and not letting that rejection get to us and and get us down. Now, I know that's easier said than done. I'm still, you know, rather sensitive to rejection myself. But I think the point is to be able to face it. And hopefully Sherry's story has uh, inspired you in that regard. And maybe, you know, gives you a little bit of courage. So either way, I hope you enjoyed this episode and have enjoyed learning about this topic of adoption trauma. And come back next week. I'm going to be joined by Becky Perkins of Fit for Thriving. And we're going to talk about the role of fitness in healing. And just as a reminder, if you want to get that free audiobook and 30 day free trial at audible.com, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible. And also don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope.